showing up and being here for Irene, Luke, Esther, and Evan. Your presence here means so much to us. And your presence goes beyond being here to support the family. Your presence here is also to celebrate Kenneth's life. We're going to start with Luke Young, Kenneth's eldest and first child up here. Hey, I haven't really prepared what to say other than what I'm about to read. First, I just want to say thank you. First, I just want to uh, thank everybody for coming. Um, we've gotten so much support that it's helped an almost impossible situation be almost bearable. So I'm about to read some of Dad's poetry. Uh, I never really connected with his poetry when he was alive, um, but it really s says something about him, and it's as Kenneth as you can get. Um, and I picked two that I think say something about Dad. Um, so here goes. This is he called this one "Ask for More." I was told that if I asked for more, it would be given. I did. It was. I asked again and was further rewarded. Then I doubted and asked for time off to review alternatives, but was told that there are none. So I tried to stop him, but my awareness kept edging me on like a stubborn mule. I became contrary. I fought the path and regressed, but it wasn't deep enough. In my prayers, I became exhilarated and saw the truth I had been denying. It is now clear that there is no turning back and no hiding. It all has to be dealt with now. And he called this one dreams of building. I can't think of a better place to read this. Oh, I dream of building something saturated in essence, each particle of the construction rich in significance, a painstaking and careful approach that leaves me exhausted and stated, stated with each step, completion will come as a revelation. The parts will be imbued with such being. Their union will create a glowing field. The whole will pulse with ethereal power, physical properties outshone by blinding intensity. It will not be seen, only experienced. An experience that will fill the senses to overflowing and give delight. That's it. Just two of them. 
There were a lot of them to choose, but I figured two would be. Well, Vicky helped me. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you again, everybody. Um, especially, I, I know I've been sort of the uh, contact point for a lot of people. I just want to say thank you again. All right. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm reading, it says in the program, right, um, from Kenneth's memoirs. He has lots of stories he started collecting about the family to pass down to his kids, and aren't we glad he did? And uh, this piece is about meeting Irene. So instead of the wise old man and uh, that you just heard from, uh, this is the young, vulnerable guy just over from across the pond. <clears throat> I was always a desperate cook, more interested in the colors and the strong smell of spices than the final taste. There were three fresh pasta stores on the street, so pasta was the choice for most meals. While I was splashing around in the kitchen with our guests arrived, when our guests arrived, and the mumble of talk and laughter could be heard over the steam and the chopping, Cooking for eight was unusual, and I was looking doubtfully into a deep pot of ratatouille when Deborah popped her head around the corner, looked at me with a bright smile, and said, Hi, Kenneth! And then more loudly, Hey, come meet Kenneth! Irene came around the doorway with a swaying stride and a quizzical expression, and I looked at her. Her eyes were bright and dark, her hair was short and spiky. Her clothes were casual, comfortable. Her complexion was careless. Perhaps a little lipstick, not much else. She was not just pretty. Her face was full of action and questions. She was gorgeous. And she carried on her shoulder that particular downtown fuck you attitude. <laughs> I don't remember much of the evening, except the, that she sat carelessly with one leg draped over the arm of the chair while we spoke. I remember watching her drink malt whiskey at the 55 bar, generously poured out by Big Tommy, remember him? And the lovely walk along Bleecker Street and West 4th Street, and under the trees in a cold night. Maybe that was another evening. Irene came around the corner with a swaying stride and a quizzical expression. And I looked at her. Her eyes were bright and dark. Her hair was short and spiky. Her clothes were casual, comfortable. Her complexion was careless. Perhaps a little lipstick, but not much else. She was not just pretty, she was gorgeous. Hi everybody, I'm uh, James Young, Jamie Young, Kenneth's younger brother. Thank you all for, for coming. It's really wonderful to see all the people that Kenneth touched in his life. I thought I would start this reflection with a brief quote from another Kenneth, Ken Kesey, uh, in his wonderful book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Man, you lose your laugh you lose your footing. I think that was very fitting to Kenneth. So when I was a child, maybe nine or ten years old, Kenneth came to visit us in East Hampton one weekend. He'd already made the move from England at around 23, 24 years old. Thank you for that, Irene. And by then he'd probably been in New York for a year or two and had taken to visiting us out east pretty regularly. I think after feeling somewhat estranged, from our dad, who had started a new life in East Hampton some 15 years earlier, reconnecting with father, as he used to call Nigel, was very important to him. It was my birthday, <clears throat> and Kenneth handed me a card with a reproduction of a Picasso sketch. A very basic sketch of a face with the enormous and slightly distorted Picasso eyes. The face was surrounded 
by a roughly sketched square, each side drawn in a different vibrant color, blue, green, yellow, red. He told me it was by a very important artist. I remember looking at it rather unimpressed and finally replying, a child of five could have drawn that. I could have drawn that. He answered somewhat indignantly, yes, but you couldn't feel it. <laughs> Followed by a somewhat didactic discussion of the profound as elucidated in the simple, which was frankly lost on me. But I, I think it reflected quite a bit about Kenneth. Kenneth was independent. He lived by feel and by the clear vision of who he was and what he did. My earliest memory of Kenneth was when he visited East Hampton for the first time, which would have been sometime in the mid-70s. My impression of him was as pale, skinny. It was high summer in East Hampton, and I was sunburned and covered in ocean salt, and Kenneth looked like he'd just come from six months of meditating in the Himalaya. The English summer, perhaps? He seemed kind, gentle, sort of goofy, and with a wonderful accent that pretty women responded to wherever we went. <laughs> that I remember. <laughs> Kenneth's childhood was sometimes difficult. Whose wasn't, right? The fact is our father, Nigel, left his first family, Kenneth's mother, Joyce, our brother, Michael, and Kenneth for a new life across the Atlantic in East Hampton with my mother, Meg. The year was 1964, so Kenneth would have been 10 or so. Even before meeting my mom and remarrying, Nigel had been living in the Middle East working as a pilot. So for years, he'd seen too little of his sons. I believe Nigel's absence was formative in Kenneth's strong individuality, the clarity of his vision, and independence of thought. And that was why at 21 or so, he plucked up his roots to move across the ocean to the US. Kenneth became, and I believe was, quintessentially American. Irreverent and funny, Kenneth loved beauty. Well, let me sharpen that statement a bit. He loved a strong impression. It could be beautiful or quite hideous, but as long as it stopped you in your tracks, be it architecture, art, photography, it was likely worthwhile. When it came to his work and passion, architectural design, the aesthetic was consistent. Minimalist, clean, open, strong, and above all, arresting. The greatest sin to Kenneth was to be cookie cutter, nondescript, run of the mill, or compromising. This is how he saw his work, and this is how he lived his life. True to his independent spirit, Kenneth immediately opened a business as a general contractor, working for himself immediately, directing crews, all the while, though he harbored a dream to create soft spaces which were padded, vibrantly colored play areas for developmentally challenged or handicapped children to play freely without risk of injury. He was early for this idea and perhaps should have widened his vision as many shopping centers today and malls have what are called ballrooms for all children to jump and play safely without injury. Eventually, Kenneth's work evolved from contracting to design of interior and exterior spaces, and he perfectly straddled the artistic sketching and drawing element of the trade with the demanding project management required to ensure that his team delivered on his vision without compromise. Kenneth loved ideas, and particularly polemics. If there was a point to be argued, then he was at his happiest diving into the debate. Kenneth would often take extreme or provocative positions, and the debates were often contentious, but they were never bitter or angry. One particular discussion started when Kenneth arrived with Irene one Friday evening, and after getting a speeding ticket on his motorcycle in Queens, or was it in his first car, the icy, royal blue, Plymouth Valiant, Model year 1968 that he loved so much, it, it doesn't matter, but the Blue Valiant mention must be made. Kenneth adored that car. I think he paid around $800 for it. It was a thing of beauty. He kept a six-inch statue of Jesus glued to the center of the dashboard, <laughs> claiming that in the Dominican neighborhoods or Puerto Rican neighborhoods where he had job sites, that would mean he was okay and the car wouldn't be keyed or broken into. 
So, whatever the mode of transportation that evening, Kenneth walks into the kitchen and declares to my mother and father that we are living in the USA in a police state. <laughs> Our father, of course, takes the bait, and we end up having a debate for most of the evening <laughs> over whether or not the US was a fascist police state. <laughs> I'm not sure where it finished that night, but it sure was a lot of fun. Kenneth loved his holy cows, but not so much to revere them as to skewer or barbecue them. As a child and a young man, I was always competing on the tennis court at a rather stuffy country club in East Hampton called the Maidstone. And Kenneth and Irene showed up one year uh, for the men's finals in their 1980s Greenwich Village best. Now, Kenneth knew that most spectators, and that they both knew, would be in tennis whites or polo shirts. So he shows up in a jauntily angled white fedora with a black band, a loose-fitting black tank top, which some might refer to as a wife beater shirt, baggy linen shorts, and what can best be described as Jesus sandals. Irene, I remember you wearing a flowing beige linen dress and a big straw hat with a flowered band. My mother was not pleased. But that may have been the point. The match you watched, I came up short against a very conservative looking financier type, an older opponent who had played tennis at Harvard, and whom Kenneth henceforth dubbed Ali North. I never heard the end of how I lost to Ali North. Our father, Nigel, departed too early, at 68, disappearing in a small plane off of Two Mile Hollow Beach in East Hampton, and was never recovered. It was February of 1988. I was 20 at the time. I remember riding in Kenneth's Zuzu Trooper with our brother Michael as we four-wheeled up and down the beach trying to calculate exactly where Nigel might have gone into the sea. After Nigel's accident, and I don't know if I was aware of this consciously at the time, Kenneth became something of a father figure to me. It was never overt, but I would often consult him about major decisions I was weighing, or freely share emotions, or solicit his perspective on girlfriends, business ideas, anything really. And this continued until the day that he died. When I was going to get married in 2006 and pondering who among my close friends, to ask to be my best man, Kenneth immediately came to mind. He honored me by accepting. He danced and celebrated and had a fantastic time chatting up all of Vicky's aunties, <laughs> who were wrapped too tightly in their colorful saris, uh, and maybe convincing them that her marrying an Anglo might not be the complete end of the world. <laughs> When it came time for his toast, he opened up with a Zsa Zsa Gabor quote about houses, advising Vicky to be a good housekeeper. And the, the, the patrician Indian crowd was with her, was with him up to this point. And then he continued, if the marriage doesn't work out, be sure you keep the house. The Indian half of the audience loved that one. Married two hours and, and joking about divorce. <laughs> Somehow he pulled it off. He really was our best man that night. Kenneth had a disarming sense of humor and a tendency to celebrate, excuse me, to challenge your deeply held beliefs aggressively. But usually through humor, sometimes through mere suggestion, sometimes through direct confrontation. Somehow he managed, while being offensive, to not offend. <laughs> Most of the time, anyway. His verbal parrying was usually couched in humor and sarcasm. He was a man of strong opinions, not only about design, obviously, but also about music, literature, art, just about everything, in fact, like how to make a proper cup of coffee. I always thought this came from the necessity to forge an identity for himself in the absence of our dad and in creating a persona for himself in a new city and a new country. Above all, Kenneth was a great conversationalist. I look back and I relish the many free-flowing chats that we would have by telephone. 
The phone would ring, and by the time you looked up at the clock, 45 minutes had passed. The conversation bouncing between memories, projects, ideas, books. It was a wonderful trait he had. If he possibly could, if he had time, he always made time to hear you, to understand you. And in his challenging way, he'd draw more out of you in the conversation. I will always miss that voice of his. The last time I spent meaningfully, meaningful time, was several, the last meaningful time I spent with Kenneth was several years ago, when Vicky and our two boys, William and Bennett, and I moved out to California. We bought a house on a mountainside just outside of San Francisco that needed a pretty major renovation. Kenneth immediately volunteered to help. He flew out and we spent a week together walking the property in the house. Going to lumber yards, salvage yards, cabinetry shops. That was where I experienced the evolution of his design, his aesthetic sensibility, and came to understand the uncompromising precision with which he approached his work. Together we measured and sketched the, quitch, the kitchen drawings. Mostly he barked out orders and I took notes. But anyway, while we worked one day repairing a loose deck board, I remember him saying to me, you're too timid with that hammer. Swing it like you mean business. He took it from me, raised it over his shoulder, and in two smacks drove the nail deep into the wood. That's the way he was, confident, instinctual, decisive, and talented. When I think back on Kenneth, perhaps what stands out the most to me is his faithfulness, his constancy. He wasn't perfect. Sometimes he'd miss the nail. But he always stuck with the things that he believed and with the people that he loved. Like most things about Kenneth, I believe this was informed by his childhood. He never stopped laughing, poking, prodding and insisting. And he'll always remain my example of a loving father, a faithful husband, and a compassionate, confident man. Thank you. Can they hear me without the microphone or is the microphone better? Okay, I'll use the microphone. Usually I'm considered quite loud. Uh, Anyway, my name is David Rubel, and I had the uh, pleasure of being perhaps the greatest single focus of Kenneth's procrastination as I rent the office just below him at 25 Main Street, and Kenneth would often be my guest in the mornings before he went upstairs. And when Irene asked me to speak, uh, and I began to think about Kenneth, a, a metaphor came to my mind, not Ken Kesey, but close, uh, from my favorite novel, which is Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, by Tom Robbins. And for those of you who read it, uh, you'll perhaps remember that one of the main subplots involves a tribe of Indians that has secretly relocated to the Sierra Nevada. And as part of their main cultural uh, ritual, they have an interconnected series of caves that leads to a sanctum sanctorum. And the way they run this ritual is that a member of each of the various clans of the tribe gather at the entrance to the cave and they're all blindfolded but one. And that person leads them through a portion of the caverns, at which point he is blindfolded and someone else begins to lead. And in this way, no single person can find the Sanctum Sanctorum on his own. It relies on a combination of all the different clans. And this is, of course, a metaphor for life, in that one only knows his little part of the burrow, not the entire. Uh, not the entire system. And it's important, Tom Robbins, I think, is trying to say, to remember that whatever experience someone has, the world is a much bigger place. And that's how I, how I really feel about Kenneth. My own uh, relationship with him was one of very slow accretion. I am very slow to trust. And Kenneth would come and stop by, you know, a little bit here and there over the first five years or so. And... <laughs> he'd stay a little longer and procrastinate a little bit more, and I learned that we had some things in common. I didn't actually learn that until just now that our first cars were both uh, Plymouth Valiants, although mine was brown, uh, and a 69. But what I, one of the things I learned of, uh, about Kenneth early on was that we were both products of elite private education. And 
that would allow us to share certain things. Uh, one thing we shared was we both would complain vociferously and vituperatively when former classmates of ours who had entered public life behaved very badly. Uh, and this, of course, happened regularly. Uh, the other thing we'd often commiserate about is when gossip would reach us of astounding financial successes enjoyed by <laughs> former classmates. And we would complain to each other a little, but mostly we would remind each other that the, cho the different choices we had made in our own lives had turned out okay because we had different goals in mind than that. <laughs> so over time, Kenneth and I became closer, and after about, oh, you know, 10 or 12 years when I felt comfortable. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth and Irene and my wife Joy and I started a small business uh, to manage the properties that Kenneth had um, created, either built or renovated. And the basic idea was Kenneth was often being hounded by former clients who would say, gee, can you come over and do this? I would like the kitchen changed, the toilet is bogged up, what should I do? And this way Kenneth could send me. Uh, which was fine. And this, of course, was, as I'm sure you're not surprised, not an astounding financial success. But that wasn't why we did it. We did it so that we could spend more time with Kenneth and Irene. And I particularly did it so I could spend more time with Kenneth. Because it was fun doing things with Kenneth. Fixing crazy problems, a leaky hot tub, a stink bug infestation. It didn't matter. Uh, and it was great for me. I got to be the worker bee because Kenneth really knew what he was doing. And I'm quite fussy about these kind of things. I'm, I guess I'm Japanese in that kind of way. I don't like being associated with things that are not well done. So once again, you know, it took me a little while to trust Kenneth, but I came to appreciate, as Jamie said, his incredible precision, his great knowledge. And I merely just had to show up. It was a great deal for me. Um, and through all this, I felt that I developed a really strong relationship with Kenneth and that he was my Kenneth. You know, I had a particular idea of who he was, who I was, and how we interrelated. But since I've known Kenneth for more than 20 years, uh, I've come to realize, of course, that there were other Kenneths. Your Kenneths. Each of you had your own particular relationship with him and how in many incredibly wonderful manifestations there were of Kenneth, how he could get along with so many different kinds of people in so many different kinds of ways. And in order to honor Kenneth, I've, I've harkened back to, once again, my own relation with him and the elite public education, the elite private education we share. And one of the things that those institutions like to do is have people memorize poetry. This was never my skill. When I was a young lad, I was in the crucible in elementary school and repeated my lines in my speech terribly. But to honor Kenneth, I have tried to memorize a poem that I think is apposite. Uh, it is called Death is Nothing at All by Henry Scott Holland. And it goes, I hope I remember something like this. Death is nothing at all. I have only slipped away into the next room. I am I, and you are you. Whatever we were to each other, that we still are. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in the easy way you always did. Put no difference in your tone. Wear no forced air, air of sorrow or solemnity. Laugh as you always did at the little jokes we enjoyed. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without affect without the trace of a shadow on it. Life means what it always meant. It is the same that it ever was. There is absolutely unbroken continuity. I'll get there. Just because I am out of mind, excuse me, because I am out of sight does not mean, no, I screwed it up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me get it back together. Uh, why should I be out of mind just because I am out of sight? I am waiting for you for an interval, somewhere very near, just around the corner. Thanks. Hi, 
I'm Joyce Kite, and I'm a friend of Kenneth's. Um, up here? Good? Okay. About 15 years ago, I won Kenneth. I did. It was one of those silent auctions, and I won a consultation with a designer. At our first meeting, Ken and I were standing with Kenneth, looking at the back of our house and giving him visions of what our dream house was going to be. And I said, I want floor to ceiling windows in my bedroom. And Kenneth looked at me and said, with great British authority, you could do that, but it will look like New Yorkers came up and ruined a perfectly fine farmhouse. <laughs> I fell in love on the spot. He was blunt, opinionated, funny, and he had gorgeous white spiky hair. He also brought a can of spotted dick to a dinner party once. <laughs> What's not to love? <laughs> there was also another side of Kenneth, and I have a really beautiful memory that shows it. The four of us, Ken, me, Irene, and Kenneth, were having dinner. And conversation went from one topic to another, and landed on what was the best thing that ever happened to you. And Kenneth, very casually, and not at all with any ceremony, said, the best thing that ever happened to me is Irene. Now that's a good man, and I miss him terribly. Hi. Well, that was short, Joyce. I'm still writing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I am really such a, a panic here. Um, and it's amazing listening to everybody. I'm Stuart, friend of Kenneth's. Um, and, and I'm going to try and use notes here because otherwise I'll, I'll be nowhere. And, and the, the first thing I wanted to say was uh, uh, hold on a minute, Kenneth, uh, I'm not quite done yet. And, and I really, really feel that. And I feel he would have said that about any of us. I mean, he touched us all so much. Uh, I, I'm not done with him at all. And I'm still working on projects that, that he and I started. And, and I'm just getting to a, a new point where you were saying, David, about trusting. I, I mean, that trust thing. I, I, I always think that, I guess that Kenneth was kind of the same as well. Um, I think that I'm starting to trust him. It's been like 35 years now. And, and uh, we were just getting into a new um, form of business together. And we were both looking forward to it, I think. And um, anyway, uh, you know, Kenneth has his ways. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I met Kenneth... Um, well, Irene asked. I, I asked Irene what she expected from the speeches, and uh, she said, I, "I don't know, just like how you met, and you know where you thought you were going." And <laughs> and, and, and I, I was like, "Well, you know, Kenneth and I had been through that one a lot of times, and neither of us could remember where we met, <coughs> and we certainly didn't know where we were going." Um, but we did meet in uh, downtown. I, I didn't realize that Kenneth had been here for so long. But um, I was pretty new off the boat then. And um, he, was, he was tough. He was tough to deal with. But he would come to my loft and uh, he, he would like uh, wrangling the price of a cabinet and then looking at some artwork. And I just loved that mix of him because, of course, I wanted him to look at my artwork. And, I, and for me now, was having that history from 90, 1980, he still remembers those little things that I was working on. And till today, you know, it's, it's an incredible, he's an incredible cog in my machine. And, and my machine has definitely lost some teeth with Kenneth not being around. Um, I, I love him so much. Um, and, I, and I wish that I could have said that to him. I, I'm sure I stumbled about it in some ways. 
Um, we, we lost touch uh, after having been to each other's weddings um, in the late 80s. And he, he moved up to Columbia County to start his family. And uh, I remember Irene and her, I don't remember the, the, the spiked hair, but I remember the mini skirts always. Um, and, and it, <laughs> anyway, so, so we lost touch for a, a long time. I, I didn't know where he'd gone, um, but he'd left town. And um, I had just walked out of uh, my solicitor's office from having signed for the property we just bought up here. And we were just uh, coming around that corner of Park and Main, I think it is. And I was with my kids walking along. We were chatting away and excited about, you know, having somewhere again. Because I'd been through a divorce and this and the other. And so finally we got another house again. And this voice from behind me says, Finally! <laughs> and he knew exactly how he was saying that. Elite. You say elite school. But dude, where are you? <laughs> uh, yeah. We didn't think it was elite. <laughs> it was prison. <laughs> it, it was prison. And, and the way he said my, boy, my name was, shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> that, that was exactly how it, it was. You, you, you heard your voice in, in boarding school, and you heard your name in boarding school, and you, were in, you knew you were in trouble, probably. Uh, so, so that was his reintroduction to, to me, and uh, turned around, and, and it was Kenneth, and we, we haven't left each other's side since then. It's been magnificent. He really cogged me back into um, life up here. Um, we immediately started to... We, I think maybe Kenneth and I were dating. I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, so we went back to uh, Robin and, and I. We started uh, dining regularly with, with all of uh, Irene and Luke and Esther and, of course, Evan. <laughs> and and uh, one of the most amusing things for me was um, the table that we were all eating on, and, and um, I don't know if I remarked on it or what, but he said, yeah, you built this for me, you remember, you built this for me, and then I did start to remember, and so Kenneth has had this table for 35 years, and it's still in the, it's still in the kitchen dining room, and uh, he's raised his family around the uh, table that he persuaded me that I was able to build uh, and I had never built a table before that time and uh, let alone one with a, a cutting board that pulled out and a drawer and you know um, he I just feel from everything I'm hearing was uh, Kenneth was incredible at championing championing individuals all of us and, uh, I, I mean, I think he would take the, you know, um, I, I don't want to insult anybody, but um, ragged of crews, uh, people, you know, falling, falling this way or that, and, and persuade us that we were really totally okay and that we were just the person that he was looking for. And um, he, he's definitely championed um, me and encouraged me that's what I mean by champion. He's encouraged me to uh, come out and be, um, you know, the best, the, the, at least, you know, halfway towards the best that I can be. And, and um, to do things that I, you know, maybe didn't think I was able to. And uh, on uh, the Dugway house that he built, um, he... Uh, the first thing he wanted to do um, when, when that was uh, going on the market was to have the art show in there, which of course Kenneth was an incredible uh, gallerist. I think he would have um, been a great 
asset to the art world. Um, but uh, to, to give me a room to hang my sculptures in was just such a blessing. I'm just such a crazy blessing. And uh, I think he just brought that to uh, all of us. And, um, you know, no matter how insane the situation, and it often was, um, uh, bluster, maybe? Kenneth always pulled through it. He always just walked through it, no matter, you know, how heavy the rocks were falling. And uh, I love him deeply and miss him. Okay. Hi, my name is Rory Young. I'm Kenneth's nephew from England. And I'll be reading two poems on behalf of my father and I. The first is In My Craft or Sullen Art by Dylan Thomas. In my craft or sullen art, exercised in the still night, and only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms, I labour by singing light, not for ambition or bread, or the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write, on these spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. The second is untitled. He has gone, my brother, to Tir Nanog, and we will miss him so, but I do not fear for he is in my heart, and when that dies, he will travel with others after me. Maybe he looks down on us, or journeys in a parallel universe I cannot grasp. Maybe he is only ash in the wind and soil. It is no matter. He was my friend, I shared childhood, my humor, my impossible self. So while I breathe, he does also. And for those who loved him, thank you. Hi guys, <laughs> uh, my name is Steve Hills and uh, Kenneth was my friend as well. Um, I really know what to say so I'm just going to say what, what happened. Um, I met Kenneth back in, uh, I think it was 2005, right around just after I got done with architecture school and, uh, and uh, he needed somebody to do his drafting and so I went and met him. I brought some really cool 3D drawings, and he immediately just threw those aside. <laughs> and he said, this is one of the first things he said to me, he said, if you can't describe it to your, your customer, like what you're envisioning, if you need to use a computer model for it, then you're not doing something right. And uh, he, he was really good. He had these visions. And sometimes they made no sense whatsoever. But at the end, and this house is an example of that. Um, they always turned out great, every time. And uh, so I was lucky to work with him for uh, about three or four years in his office. And then when the economy started tanking back in 2008 or nine, I bolted. I went to this horrible place called Hawaii and uh, with his full support. <laughs> um, and I was there for about six years and we kept in contact, and when I moved back, he said he needed uh, some work done on a project, and I was getting out of the drafting and getting back into construction. So um, ever since then, uh, my nephew Mike and I, we, we partnered up and, and we worked on the last few projects for him the past three and a half years, this being the, the last one. And uh, I was lucky, really lucky. I learned a lot from that man. Way more than school could ever teach you. Uh, there's, there's a, there was a lot that that guy did right. 
There was a couple things he didn't do right. But, <laughs> but he, he did it with such grace. And the accent is really what got him through a lot of stuff. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> but uh, he really, he, he, he always appreciated if, you, if we had an issue with, on the building end of things, he would always listen. If, if it was logical, he would always listen. And he had no problem uh, caving in on, on our request. Um, and uh, yeah, he, was just, he was good like that. And like I said, we, we, we all learned a lot from that man, just the way he was. And uh, we're still going to learn from him. I guess that's it for now. Thanks, Ed. Hi, uh, I'm David Weiss. Um, like everyone else here who's not a family member, I'm a friend of Kenneth's. Um, I met him about eight years ago through my wife, Bobby. Um, and uh, I don't know, we just, we just hit it off. And then when the economy crashed, as Steve said, uh, we just decided, you know, screw renovation because that's not happening anymore. We're just going to buy some sad houses and make them look good again. And that's what we did. And this, is, this was the last sad house that is probably itself quite, quite happy at what we've accomplished. As Steve said, they, they somehow in the end came out looking good. So what I'm going to say, in a sense, has been said by everybody in different ways. Um, but. Um, since I wrote it, I can't skip all the things that I said. So, I'm going to start with a poem that, uh, that came to me uh, before we found out that Kenneth uh, wasn't going to survive his ordeal. Um, and then I'll have some other things to say, so here's the poem. What will it take, future, to make a past we can live with? A crow swoops out of the tree, and the hill falls away as it flaps, unflappable through unbounded space. Below it, the three turkeys that remain are crossing the snow-dusted meadow, single file. My friend, in a coma, 10,000 feet above us, is working out the angles of incidence, of refraction, Solving for X. So much for him to get done. What will it take, future, to leave nobody out? Coal is burning somewhere, tires too. Here it's propane, wood. There's an idea in the wind that's catching. Let things find out for themselves what they are. A sudden gale keeps the crow from coming back. Next year never happens, but a minute from now does. The counsel you give future no longer comes from you by the time we receive it. My friend knows how to coax space into giving up its secrets, into caring without seeming to. My friend is tunneling through the upper air now. I can hear the crow, though I can't see it. The urgent call it makes has in it something that has not yet taken place, like an unhung door that dreams of opening. So I've often thought about, marveled about, really, Kenneth's design sense and his architectural style. They seem to represent who he was, as people have said. At least they say something about who he was. The idea that he coaxed space into caring without seeming to catches something that I loved in Kenneth and his work and that I'm going to try to put my finger on. One of his basic words to describe a building, or for that matter, a novel he liked, was and I can't say it the way he said this word. He made this word feel like a cosmos. 
He said it was brutal. <laughs> You've probably all heard that. And that for him was a term of high praise. He liked things to look like what they were, and he liked them to look like what they did and show signs of their origins and their making. He liked materials to show their materialness. That was a kind of candor. In that spirit, he liked clean and simple lines. He didn't like the decorative, the adorned, veneer. He liked brutal, the unpretentious, the undecorative, the blunt, the unapologetic. All things people have said about him. He liked to let things express themselves. But he also liked veneer. <laughs> but he liked veneer that was brutal. <laughs> if by brutal now we mean interesting in and of and for itself. The eucalyptus veneer here in the kitchen of this house asserts its right to a place at the table and to have a voice. It's not there just to blend in or harmonize. Its virtue isn't that it's veneer. Its virtue is that it's striking, beautiful, expressive, strong. It belongs, but not by virtue of how well it gets along with everything and or everyone. Its virtue doesn't lie in the way it masks or covers. It draws attention to itself. It's a, it's a bit rude, yes, but really something memorable. In these ways, it's like Kenneth. And it's what Kenneth liked in other people, their individuality. It wasn't niceness that he liked in others, and he was often critical. He had a sharp tongue, but he wasn't judgmental. What he admired in you was your you-ness. That for him, I think, was a deeper thing than morals, people he cared about. Even his exasperation was a form of caring. The great English poet W.H. Auden said of the great Irish poet W.B. Yeats that mad Ireland hurt him into poetry. And I think that's how it worked with Kenneth too. He was hurt into his various poetries. He was hurt into reaction and response, feeling and opinion. First, he'd be irritated. Hardly a conversation we had on the phone or together didn't begin with cultural complaints, something that was bugging him. Talking details and decisions we had to make about, say, this house, never began by getting down to business, as if to say that this business shit, however necessary, was really secondary. One's condition or some condition of the world came first and mostly began by insightful grousing till the hurt of it backed off. But that still wasn't enough to get down to business. Hurt abated, he might start talking about a movie he'd just seen or a song in his head, or this would, and, or this, and this would take place Sorry, this jumped into a different spot. Hold on a second. This would take place in the register of pleasure, amazement, or admiration. The aim of grousing always was to get past it. That British phrase, bloody hell, did double duty. It punctuated complaining, but it also did heavy lifting by expressing the marvelous or the transcendent like while listening to a 15-year-old Stevie Winwood playing piano and perfectly channeling Ray Charles as he sang, Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out. A YouTube pub crawl that happened the night before he and Irene left for Panama landed us on that Stevie Winwood clip, still pretty flu-ridden. His eyes nevertheless got wet and shiny with astonishment at what this kid was doing. Uh, and his eyes often got that way when that happened. Bloody hell, he said. <laughs> Kenneth knew that the arts had to, quote, take an ax to the frozen sea within, as Franz Kafka put it. Because the straight stuff was the only way through the shadow of the valley of life. 
Not pulling your punches was what you did if you really cared. One of the signs that he cared in a big way about how we express ourselves and about us all is that so many of us are here. Somewhere in this county, perhaps in many somewheres, sit stones which were meant to be the steps into St. Peter's Church in Spencertown. Somewhere those stones lie. This all happened 25 years ago. My name is Steve Phelps and I was pastor of that church. Irene had been coming to the church. I think Esther was just born. Does that sound about right? No. No. <laughs> okay. Not me. No, not you, Evan. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Irene had come to the church. She and I had had a couple of conversations. I was at the house. I met Kenneth. It came up that there was a plan afoot to build a new entranceway into the church and ramp and so on and he made an extraordinarily effective claim that it had to be done in natural stone. He had the whole idea laid right out there and it moved me. I love that idea. And so he prepared a bid. He even told me where the stones would be found and he made up some drawings and I prepared to bring this to the church council. In the next days, however, some men came from downstate in trucks, and in a single day, they built the stone, excuse me, the stairs into the church from paving stones, and completely finished the entire work all in a matter of a day. Kenneth heard nothing about this from me because it happened so fast. He saw it, and I knew, as I had come to know him so briefly, that he would be very dismayed, confused, dismayed. And so I went out to see him, and I explained. The father of a man named Michael, whom we knew and loved in this church, who had died from AIDS, a man who was a contractor and an Italian and liked getting things done fast had also no words for his sense of gratitude for what we had done and how we had embraced his son whose life and partnership with Gordon had caused the family to split apart. And so this was his sign of gratitude, all done in a day. And I told this story to Ken Kenneth, and he waved it all away. He let it go. Our friendship began that way. Now, the stones of his plan, and perhaps many plans, do lie in this county somewhere. Perhaps they're in a wall he built for someone else, perhaps Somebody else built a wall with them. Perhaps they're in a floor somewhere. Perhaps they're still in the quarry. The stones are out there somewhere. The plan is gone. The stones are out there. And Kenneth is not. It may seem trivial to give so much attention to a plan that went to nothing. It's concreteness around Ideas that, frankly, happen every day. A woman picks up a skein of yarn, thinks about a sweater for a certain so-and-so, and puts it back. And the yarn goes off and lives another day. A person marries and lets it go. And the unknown the love goes off and lives another day. So it's quite common, but it is not trivial. 
that our plans exist in our mind and some become concrete and some do not. Ideas. You've been hearing about it all afternoon. Ideas are all we ever had. They completely make us up. The commitments, the hopes, the ideas, the good ideas, these are our entire substance. These were our building stones. They made us. It isn't really a question of whether we succeeded with our plan, with our idea, but these conceptions of ours have brought us to be what we are. It's no word play that we ourselves were conceived by our parents. And if in the gift of things we conceive children, so this conceiving, this idea, this plan is really the whole of us. So it is that somewhere in the county still there are the stones that Kenneth can see for that particular entryway into that little church. And that one idea, like so many, that is gone, except for the story of it. But countless others of Kenneth's ideas are, are really built into the land. They are raised up in the marriage and in the children. They are everywhere, these ideas. So it puts a question, is that what we mean when we say that a person has life after death, that he lives in memory, or if as concrete a worker as Kenneth was, lives in buildings? Perhaps that's not adequate. I have no idea what death is. I do not see that the doctrines of religion afford any person any knowledge of what death is, no matter what they say. In fact, I don't think that religion ever intended to be so certain about any of it. But anyone can see that we live up against the wall of death. It affects everything we say, every choice we make everything we do, it shapes us through and through, this fact, this wall of death. I myself, I've never taken any comfort, I don't even agree at all with that idea that death is natural, that it is a part of life. It's evident that death is a part of living things, but we are not things. At least. We are not primarily things, not at all. We are, you've been hearing this from all these stories, we are an openness, we are an infinity. With no more effort than to stop perseverating about whatever obsesses our mind, we can cast this mind on the endless flow of the mountains of that river and of all rivers and the waters. A mind can take this infinity in. With just a little cast of mind we can go to the depths of the sea, to the depths of no thought at all, of sonnets and songs and seasons. We can conceive infinity. You know, there exists a number, a number corresponding with the tally of every sun-spread leaf and blade of grass in every wood and forest and meadow on the whole of Earth. And you can imagine that there is such a number. We are an infinity. Death is not in the nature of infinity. 
And so death is not part of our nature. Death is some kind of shock. It is an attack on something essential. It is an attack on our infinity. It seems an, an error away from the inner. Do you ever get the symbol D-I-V on your computer? Div error. Death is a div error on our infinity. It does not compute. So here we are, up against the wall of death, with our, our hand right on it, as we can see of Kenneth. Here, in this afternoon, there may come an intimation of the infinite and the eternal that surrounds us, that breathes us and breathes all being. Here there may come an intimation that nothing, I mean nothing just is what it is. But everything is a parable, or can be a parable, an invitation to conceive of it, or of her, or of him, to conceive of these things we encounter, these persons we encounter, as a touch from the eternal. Everything, everything is a parable of the infinite, the beyond, everything is an opening, can be an opening, to let the mind pass beyond itself, beyond, beyond. Everything we touched, everyone who touched us, everything. Directing our mind beyond. Nothing, literally so, not the stones that are bereft of Kenneth's brief plan. <laughs> not these great buildings. Not our friendships. Nothing is just what it is. To feel so sharp in the loss of our beloved. everything we're seeing here today. Dad, I am so very real. Oh, my day gone back. I thought we got off every song of your Yes. Yeah, I got the mic. <laughs> There's a really nice drawing in the front. Uh, people in the front can probably see that. Are those flowers? Yes. Nice. <clears throat> okay, it says, Dear Dad, I am sorry you died. Please come back on Monday. I love you, Dad. Love, Evan John Young. because of the common bound 
You see, we were both parents of three children. The youngest, a son born with Down syndrome. While the relationship began as a client financial advisor one, over the next few years, it became more of a friendship. I looked forward to our semi-annual meetings, most of which took place in Kenneth's office in Chatham. When we discussed the financial strategies that we had put in place, our conversations generally always transitioned to conversations about family. It's in mind. It was clear that Kenneth was extremely proud of his children, Luke, Esther, and Evan. and their accomplishments, as well as his wife, Irene. When Kenneth's words always kept everything together for our family, he was especially proud of Evan's accomplishments. Something I could relate to easily as my wife and I watched our son, Craig, grow and develop into a fun young man, much like Evan. Unfortunately, for unknown reasons, God has decided that he has a higher calling for Kenneth. And while we grieve over that decision, in the coming days, I would encourage all of you to remember a moment, a get-together, or a conversation that you had with Kenneth that made you smile. As you can remember that, please don't be afraid to smile again. I'm sure that he will be smiling with you. I will miss Kenneth, as I'm sure all of you will. He was a good friend who has been taken from us far too soon. When my wife and I lost our nine-year-old granddaughter over three years ago, a void was created in our lives that may never go away. Now another void has been created for all of us, one which will take time for all of us to heal. In closing, I'd like to share with you the lyrics of a song my wife and I came across several years ago that we read often to help us with our healing, and I hope it may help you as well. It's entitled, Goodbye is Not Forever. I'm sure that Kenneth would want us all to feel that way. The old thing ever. Goodbye is not forever. It was quite a ride. I have lived a good life. I fought a good fight, and I want you to know it was hard to let go until I saw the light. The Lord called my name. Angels came and took me by the hand, and off to heaven we flew. Now I'm singing with the angels, walking on streets of gold, marveling at the wonder of the beauty of it all. No more trials or tribulations. My soul has been set free. This place is indescribable. I'm as happy as can be. Goodbye is not forever. We can meet again one day. Till then, just keep on keeping on. And heaven is just a prayer away. I'm singing with the angels, walking on streets of gold, marveling at the wonder and the beauty of it all. No more trials or tribulations. My soul has been set free. This place is indescribable. I'm as happy as can be. Goodbye is not forever. Well, as I said, I wasn't planning on sharing anything, but as I read through these lyrics, and something that Jamie reminded of us, to have a conversation with Kenneth. Kenneth always provoked us to think deeper, uh, to challenge our thoughts. And as I read through these lyrics, there was a line that struck me. I want you to know it was hard to let go until I saw the light. Letting go of Kenneth is hard. I get sad when I think of Irene, Luke, Esther, and all of us missing Kenneth. But when I think of Kenneth, I get a smile and joy because of the light and because I know Kenneth is in heaven. I remember a conversation I had with Kenneth when they lived on Harlemville Road. Kenneth was reading from the Bible and he came across a passage in 1 John 2, 1 and 2. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Kenneth asked me, what does propitiation mean? 
I told him I wasn't sure. So I made a point to find out. From the Greek, propitiation means mercy seat. And it's only through faith in Christ that we obtain mercy to be able to enter heaven into the presence of a holy God. And because Kenneth placed his faith in Christ Jesus, as the song says, I'll get to meet Kenneth again in heaven, which if you can imagine will be even more beautiful than this here. <coughs> Goodbye is not forever. I know that Kenneth would love to see each of you one day in heaven.